Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 136 of ASBN Live, The Real Bottom Line, meeting our fundamental needs while bringing about personal and organizational transformation. I'm your host, Gulissi Sivalingam, the Senior Manager of Events and Programming at the American Sustainable Business Network. Today's webinar is presented by ASBN's Livable Planet Working Group, which I am a proud member of that I join for every one of their meetings. And I know they've put a lot of hard work into this presentation, and I'm so excited to learn about this kind of bent on philosophy and combining it with our connection to nature. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Terry Gibbs from the Livable Planet Working Group to start kicking us off. Take it away, Terry. Thanks so much, Yolasi. Uh, it's so great being able to have all of you, and uh, uh, I'm not sure what is happening, why my screen is not now. Why it's not going. That is very strange. It was just where, oh, here we go. Yeah. So we'd really like to welcome all of you, and uh, we'll briefly introduce ourselves. And, um, and while we are doing that, we hope that uh, you'll introduce yourself in the chat with your name, organization, and location with acknowledgement of the original stewards of the land we're currently occupying. So um, I am uh, here in the land of the uh, Anishinaabe, um, George Floyd, and the 10,000 Lakes of Minnesota. And uh, I have, I, Volunteer as president of the Alliance for Sustainability, which I helped to co-found 40 years ago. And I have a sustainability consulting firm called Sustainability Associates. And I'll turn it over to you, Susan. Hi, um, I'm Susan Eirich. I'm the founder and uh, executive director of Earth Fire Institute, which is a wildlife sanctuary and retreat center. Um, if I look over there and throw a stone a couple of miles, I'll hit the top of the Grand Teton National Park. Um, and the, and what really where we are is the western watershed of this incredible uplift. And I really like talking about coming from the land itself, not just the political areas, and making sure we add the land itself um, to the history of of appreciating where we're at. Thank you. Jan Janice? And uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Janice Bermudez, and um, you can hear me okay, I think? Yes. Um, great. Um, I'm an environmentalist and activist, a music lover, and I'm a commercial banker for Amalgamated Bank. And today I'm calling in from uh, the city of Los Angeles, which are on the ancestral lands of the Tonga people. And um, Anytime I fly in here, I always see all of the, so many different buildings all on flat land and all of a sudden the ocean is here. And I just always think about what it must've looked like before centuries ago when those ancestral folks were taking care of this wonderful, beautiful land that we have. Thank you for being here. So Susan, do you wanna start with the acknowledgements? Um. I was going to do the goals, Terry. Um, we're doing the acknowledgments now. The land acknowledgement. Oh, so, oh, okay. I went to humans, which is a big mistake on my part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's incredibly important for us, um, whenever we do acknowledgments, to acknowledge not just the humans and all the stuff that we have contributed to these efforts, but to acknowledge the land itself, the living land from which we arose. Um, we forget that, but it's the root of where we come from. So wherever we are, not only the human stewards, but the living land itself. Beautiful, thank you. Janice? Um, again, just calling in from the ancestral lands of the Tonka people in Los Angeles, but um, originally from Denver, where 
uh, the Cheyenne, Ute, and Arapaho uh, nations, um, were the original stewards of that land. And we really want to express our, our thanks to ASBN, um, uh, to Lassie and all the other great staff at ASBN for uh, all the support that they have been giving to us, to our Livable Planet Working Group. We have a wonderful, uh, just growing group, and we really welcome you to join us. It's been one of the best parts for me of being part of ASBN, uh, getting to talk about these really important issues, and specifically to our cultural change and media team that where this sort of originated, uh, along with the natural step where I first actually uh, experienced some of this amazing work on fundamental needs. And what happened is, is that we did a uh, uh, short presentation uh, to the Livable Planet Working Group, and there was a lot of interest. And I thought, well, maybe it would be good to open it up to the whole community um, and to the public, um, because this work is just so significant about fundamental needs. And so people were very supportive about it. And we had a series of meetings. One of the people who unfortunately could not join us is Steve Weinberg, who's been a really integral leader uh, with all the work. Steve is the um, uh, head of sustainability for uh, uh, for IKEA for its supply chain operations in, in North America. And unfortunately, not unfortunately, it's really great. He's having to work for the uh, climate week. Um, so he's not going to be able to join us, but he was one of the people with Janice and Susan and I that really were brainstorming and it was it's been an amazing process as we've sort of experienced this. Um, so we're really excited to share some of the things that we've learned from each other uh, in the time that we have together. Uh, and really, and special thank you to all of you for being here with us and, and hope this could be a really wonderful experience for you. Janice, you want, uh, I'm sorry, Susan, you want to go into the goals? Yeah, so uh, we thought a lot about what it is we really want to do. And what we really want to do is going to be based on something that's fundamental from which all the other things come. So the first one is to gain new insights about ourselves and others that can allow us to live more fulfilled lives and workplaces, consume less, and live more simply and in harmony with our home the earth, and all of creation. To help us shift our orientation and develop a wider understanding, how we can use our brains differently and access different aspects of our own intelligence. Um, to generate an individual sense of freedom and transformation. To transform business as we know it. That's really the essence of what we're trying to do in this particular uh, workshop. Um, and in some sense, what ASBN is trying to do. Um, make this as exciting, existential, and interactive as possible and welcome you sharing your questions, experiences, and thoughts. This is a conversation where none of us are experts. We're all working together to find a new way. Thanks, Susan. So as far as the agenda, we wanna begin by just hearing your perspectives about fundamental needs, and then just talk about something that a lot of us have probably grown up with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, and then share some, I think, really breakthrough thinking uh, by Dr. Monfred box -Neef. Um, And then Susan's going to talk about our need for connection with nature. Uh, Janice is going to speak about uh, perspectives on finding purpose in banking, an amazing story. I'll just share briefly, um, sort of on behalf of of Steve about uh, uh, IKEA, because I think they've been doing wonderful work in terms of meeting fundamental needs. And then we really, the thing that we're most excited about is to open up to actually having time to share about your experiences meeting fundamental needs and the possibilities that we could co-create. Um, so we'll begin with our opening questions, Janice. Thanks, Terry. So we would love for all of you to consider um, the answers to a couple questions to kind of kick us off. Um, first, how are you meeting your fundamental needs today? And second, what are one or more of your fundamental needs? And we'll we'll take a little time to just give you a chance. And and because of I've got the screen up, I can't see very much. So I'll count on you, Susan and Janice to maybe share any of that, you know, some of those comments that people are putting in. 
give about a minute or so for you to type in your answer. I will just say, I don't want to bias any of you, but one of the things that often comes up with many people uh, are, you know, some confusion about what are wants and what are needs. And we're going to explore what these sort of deeper fundamental needs are as opposed to, oh, you know, I want a yacht and I want a second home and I want all kinds of things like that, as opposed to really what are fundamental needs and and um, I think the cool thing about fundamental needs are they're things that give us life, uh, that are bring vitality and, uh, and can be transformative. And uh, so I'll be curious to see what you guys think in the chat. Do we have any that are up there? Yeah, look, we have a few answers. Um, Self-nourishment through lunch at the moment. I think it's the lunchtime for some of us. <laughs> um, the connection with family and friends, um, staying in touch regularly, and uh, time with grandchildren and our families and loved ones, and learning and teaching um, our passions for that, um, or for you know what we do in our lives, and um, you know saving money, food, shelter, um, mobility, uh, fresh air, clean air. Um, having a regulated or the ability to regulate temperature <laughs> given it's so many heat waves nowadays. Yeah. Um, yes. Exercise um, and spending time with friends. Beautiful. What a great list. And I, I think uh, maybe you guys don't need this, uh, you know, webinar because I think you guys <laughs> got what it's about. Um, but I think that's, that's beautiful what you all shared. Um, so let's, let's go on and let's, let's begin by talking about Maslow. I mean, this is the guy that I grew up with and I thought it was like, he was so great. You know, oh my gosh, here they are, these five things. Sometimes people talk about them as a pyramid. Um, uh, you know, all these cool things, you know, starting with physiological at the bottom. And, and basically he made the point that you need to have the bottom one first. And once you've got physiological met, like some of you were talking about food, um, you know, or temperature or that kind of thing, then you go up to safety needs. And, um, and then once you've got that, then you move up to love and belonging. Um, and then from there you go to esteem and then you get to my favorite one, which is what I really, really liked, which was self-actualization, the desire to become more than one can be. And I think that's really beautiful and I loved it. And I thought it was just so great. And I thought about it and used it all of the time. And, what happened though, over time, is um, I got exposed to the next thing that I wanna share with you, which is the work of this man, uh, Dr. Monfred Moxneef. Um, he is a Chilean economist. Uh, he's known as the barefoot economist for his work in Africa and in Latin America. Uh, he's the head of a big university in Chile. Uh, and he wrote, he came up with this concept of bottom-up, people-centered, sustainable development and worked all over Africa and Latin America uh, and became the, known as this barefoot economist and wrote uh, very little in English. Almost everything is in Spanish, but this very profound, probably one of the hardest books to understand I've ever read called Outside in Real Life Economics. And it's really quite powerful. And I first learned about this actually in a sauna uh, on the uh, in in northern uh, Sweden, right uh, next to Finland, uh, and I thought I was hallucinating um, with how amazing this was between the heat of the sauna that these Swedes were telling me about and the work that he was doing, and it really was transformative. And I've been working with this now for well over twenty years. And I think it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, for this work of his, he got the alternative Nobel Prize. Um, and his core idea is this, that we can meet people's fundamental needs with unlimited amounts of learning, laughter, love, meaningful work, 
and community while eliminating what we don't want, stress, expense, pollution, and violence. And I think it's really quite powerful to imagine what that's about. And as you're about to see, rather than it being a pyramid, as Maslow would describe it, he actually sees it as 10 fundamental needs. So we're gonna take a look at that right now. Um, so this is the boiled down essence of some very complex ideas that he puts forward. The first of these four ideas that I wanted to share with you is that he says that fundamental human needs are defined and possible to classify. We know what these needs are. Um, and here is what he puts forward as the 10 fundamental needs that every person has. Subsistence, protection, security, affection, understanding, participation, leisure, creativity, identity, meaning, freedom, and transcendence. And you'll notice that some of these are similar to some of the things that Maslow uh, had to say. Some are a little bit different. Here is, um, in leading workshops on this, uh, in New York uh, City, I was leading a workshop, and uh, one of the participants was a poet and a songwriter. And he was so inspired by this, it was a two evening workshop, and he came back the second evening and he shared on one single sheet of paper sort of his take on what these needs were. And I wanna share that with you here. So this is, his name is Ed Kopp. And um, so this is what he wrote. Uh, a sustainable self is composed of a physical body that is healthy, exercises, eats a proper diet, gets ample rest and is protected and secure with ample shelter and surrounded by family and friends and is allowed to express affection, emotion, and share feelings, desires, and emotions so that you gain understanding of yourself, others, and the world. To participate, serve, and contribute to your family, friends, causes, charities, and to allow yourself to be contributed to, which can be balanced by leisure, to take time out, to not do, to do things for the sake of pure enjoyment, to relax, which allows for creativity, to allow your own essence, your distinct personality to come through in any form it wishes, be it music, art, dance, writing, sports, which gives you a sense of identity, that special something in you that makes you distinctly you, which leads to transcendence and one's connection to all things, to know that you are one small piece of the whole, which liberates you to freedom and control of your own destiny, your choices, your intentions, your actions, create your reality. And I have to tell you that when I looked at that sheet of paper, I went, I cannot believe it. Everything that I want in my life is on this sheet of paper. I had never seen a statement that encompassed everything that I want, that I want to be, that is essential to me. And there it was on a single sheet of paper. So I think this sort of captures uh, the essence of what Max Neve is talking about. He uses much more complex language, but th these are the core ideas that he puts forward. The second idea that he puts forward is that these needs are the same in all countries and throughout all history. These needs have never changed. How we have met the needs has changed over time, but these fundamental needs are really what define it, what it means to be a human being, that all humans have always had these needs. And again, rather than them being a hierarchy, as Maslow would put forward, they are always present for all people. And some people may not do self-actualization at the top. They may do it as the very first thing that may be their motivator. And so it depends on each person which I think is really quite profound. The third thing he says is that they're not interchangeable with each other. So in other words, you could have a lot of money which may take care of your need for subsistence or security, but it doesn't do anything about meeting your other fundamental needs. And he goes on to say that in fact, as far as meeting fundamental needs, we think that money um, is the way that we can satisfy those needs um, and that money defines it. But he argues, in fact, that the US is perhaps 
the poorest country in the world in terms of meeting fundamental needs. And it helped me when I heard that because I could understand that while we accumulate so much stuff, um, that doesn't actually fulfill so many of these fundamental needs that we have. And it's why I discovered in other countries that very often people are far more fulfilled even though they have far less things. So it was really quite transformational when I realized this, um, uh, that you know, it's, it's a huge way of seeing things in a new way. And the last thing he says is that we can have more satisfaction and use less stuff. We don't need more stuff to be more fulfilled. And this is quite profound because it opens up the possibility that if we understand these fundamental needs, we can re reorganize our lives, our personal lives, our work lives, our communities with the design to be to fulfill these in abundance, that this doesn't have to take a lot more money, that we can fulfill them on so many different other levels without destroying the planet, consuming it to death uh, uh, with what John DeGraff calls this disease affluenza. So there's a whole nother way that we can be to both meet everybody's fundamental needs and not destroy the planet. Here is a practical example of this in action in Gothenburg, Sweden's second largest city, a huge apartment complex. And they wanted to be environmentally responsible. So they did solar panels and daylighting and energy conservation. But they did one other thing that was really profound. They put in an attached greenhouse. And, you know, an attached greenhouse is great because it uh, you can grow healthy food and you can... Um, use it to get passive solar energy to warm the building. Nice things. But what they didn't realize is how it met so many of these under other fundamental needs. So not only for subsistence and security, because you know each other, but for identity and meaning and creativity and participation and leisure. So what this illustrates is that if once we understand what our fundamental needs are, that we can design our homes, workplaces, and communities to fulfill those needs in abundance. Um, we can do this. Um, I shared about this uh, one night with Ray Anderson, the head of Interface. And at the end of the night, Ray said to me, Terry, this is what I have been looking for. This is the design of the prototype company of the new millennium. And he started using it at Interface. So this is really powerful and really transformative. The cool thing about this is that we're not leaving anybody out. This includes everyone. Everybody has these fundamental needs. When I have shared this, I find nobody is against it. And I can share this with Republicans, Democrats, Greens, Independents, and everybody resonates with this. Uh, they've used it at Interface. So we can meet everybody's fundamental needs. This is not difficult. And as I was mentioning, this is the best antidote to this disease of affluenza. So rather than telling people that they have to give up things, that they have to sacrifice, live with less, we can actually say, we can turn it 180 degrees and say, you can actually have more of what you really want like healthy, attractive, and nurturing environments. And at the same time, less of what you don't want, expense, pollution, violence, stress. <clears throat> so this is really quite profound in terms of what that opportunity is for all of us. And the proof text, I've been speaking about this, you know, all around the world, uh, all across the US with conservative groups and other groups. And it was just amazing that people totally resonated with it. You know, it didn't matter if it was in Mexico or South Africa or in England, uh, Ireland, wherever it was, people absolutely loved it. And then came 9-11. And when 9-11 happened, um, everybody looked at their lives differently. Everybody was in the question, why am I here? What is my purpose? And they asked, how can I serve? How can I contribute? How can I make a difference? It was really quite extraordinary. But what did our country's leaders, leadership ask us to do? 
Anybody remember? Go shopping. And all of us knew that's not what we wanted to do. That, and here is the best news that I can share with you. We knew that we didn't want to do it. We are far more than our things. We have been brainwashed into thinking that we are consumers, but we care. We are citizens. People care very deeply, but we don't get seen that way. We don't see ourselves that way. So I feel this is truly a conversation of our time. It can be totally transformative and change every institution and do it really quickly. Uh, so we can, we can cure our consumption addiction, affluenza, and not consume the planet to death. And I heard this uh, great sustainability leader, uh, Mike Nickerson uh, from Canada say this. He said, we can no longer have everything we want. And to be honest, I was really sad because I'm an American, I can have everything. But then I read the next line, but we can be more than we ever imagined. And that's really the power of this, that we have this choice that we can make about how we live and how we are with each other and with the planet. So welcome any questions, insights, and comments that you have on that. We'll just take a few minutes for that and you can put them in the chat or you can go live. Um, I don't, I can't see everybody uh, uh, on here. So maybe I think it'll show up. You can raise your hand if you have a, a live comment or you can put it in chat. And maybe Susan and Janice, cause again, I can't see it cause of my screen. Um, if there are any questions, comments that we should address. So Jan has her hand raised, I see. You want to unmute Jan? Yeah, thanks. I did. Yeah, it strikes me that uh, since the pandemic, uh, it's a little bit similar to after the 9-11 uh, tragedies, that everybody's re-evaluating uh, what their connections are uh, to life. Wow. And having spent the last year and a half, uh, more or less, in Costa Rica, mostly in a one-room adobe house. Um, just recently, when I moved to Colorado to be with my grandchildren, my two of my three sons just this week brought all of my things back from storage in Idaho and New York. And I'm looking around at all this stuff that I had culled down to nothing. I thought, then what am I, what do I need this for? This is amazing. Having spent the last year and a half with one suitcase and in one room uh, in yeah. nature with my dog. It just strikes me as bizarre. And what you're saying is so right on. Yeah, my comment. thanks. Yeah, I feel the same way with all my junk too. And I'm very happy to just be in a simple room with almost nothing. It's a great point. Any other comment, question? Anything in the chat, Janice or Susan? Anne-Marie says so much wisdom here. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, I, I actually do have a question. So what, what do we do with this? Or is this the next part? Is I it, missed that. What, what do we I do will, with this? How, how do we bring this thinking forward into the world? Is that what we're going to explore next? or? Uh, yeah, we can. That's what at the end, we're, we'll have a chance to talk about it. And okay. then we're going to go on right now to hear just some other perspectives about fundamental needs. So we sort of have a whole, a more whole picture. And then we want to hear your guys' perspectives on other aspects. And then we really would like to explore exactly your question. What do we do? How can we move this kind of thing, this kind of discussion forward to have more of an impact, um, whether it's in ASBN or in our lives at work, you know, or in our community. So it's a great question. Thanks, Henry. All right. So should we go on to Susan? So, um, and I'm going to stop sharing so we can see you. So I resonate with everything that the reason I wanted to um, do this with Terry when I heard about it is because um, we need to start with fundamental needs. Um, de dealing with needs that are less fundamental simply isn't going to take us where we need to go. Um, and in my 
way of thinking, one of the most fundamental needs, which I agree with Terry, um, the excitement of transcending and becoming more than we ever thought we could be. But in order to do that, we need to connect with who we actually are. And part of who we actually are is from nature. So um, what happens when we connect with nature? What kind of fundamental needs do we actually meet when we make that connection? I'm going to list them and then talk about each one a little bit. There's a sense of bonding and flow that happens that enriches us and heals us and calms us. There's a sense of companionship. Um, there's a sense of relationship. Um, there's a sense of connection. Um, there's an ability to activate different aspects of our brain that we don't ordinarily use in Western civilization or thinking or abstract thinking uh, or really essential parts of our brain and our talents. We get us, to me, one of the most important things is we get a sense of coherence. We belong to something larger that's a pattern that's far wider than and wiser than us. We belong to something and is coherent as opposed to the disintegration so many of us experience within ourselves and in uh, our current civilizations. Um, we end up shifting our orientation to a wider understanding, um, a richer understanding, not only human needs, uh, which enriches us immensely. Um, if we're in nature, we slow down. Um, and all kinds of interesting things happen when we slow down. We slow down, ideally, to the pace of the earth and of life. Um, if we're in connection with nature, we operate um, from where life really is, not from what our ideas of what life is, not from what our incredibly brilliant, active, creative brains conjure up, all of which is good and valuable, but it doesn't necessarily follow the way that life actually works. And if we operate from there, we'd come up with very different decisions and ultimately a tremendous sense of belonging. So those are the needs that I see connecting with nature helps. And then from there, we build our personal lives. From there, we build our relationships. From there, we build our businesses in connection with everything else. So um, bonding, um, and in order to make the shift we need, we connect deeply or fall in love with other life forms. All of us have that experience with it, be it with a dog, a cat, a bird, a tree. What happens when we bond deeply with another life form? It opens a connection and a connection opens channels. And through those channels flows all kinds of interesting information. It's not intellectual information and strength and healing and it helps lead to creative practical solutions. I think a fundamental human need as one of my veterinary friends said, is um, we're, we're practical problem solvers also. That's part of what we do as humans, um, using our excellent brains that way. So bonding with other life forms and, and then creating a sense of flow rather than disconnection. Companionship. Many of us have either sat at the base of tree, a tree and felt something, or again with our dogs or our cats or with a sunset. There's a um, story someone told me once in the Tibetan, uh, old Tibetan culture. Sometimes one Tibetan would travel, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 hours to go and make a, a visit. And they would come to the other yurt and they would sit and they would sit for a few hours and then he would get up and leave. There wasn't a need for this conversation. It was a connection, a sense of profound companionship and nurturing, in this case, between two humans. Um, one of the reasons that connecting with nature is so important is that's from whence we arose. We're part of it, we're part of earth, we're part of life. And to the extent we disconnect from that, we're disconnected from our very roots, the source of our sustenance. Um, in terms of, uh, this, there was a wonderful artist called uh, Lilleforce who did wildlife art because he really understood how, he talked about how the animals of which we are part are the ultimate expression of the land. And his paintings show that deep connection between the land into the creation of mammals. And he didn't do humans, but he could have. Um, I was at a conference once that was called Our Sacred Earth. 
And one of the people there was talking about how we could build differently. And he was talking all excitedly about developmental plans, et cetera. And I very unkindly asked him, but have you asked the land that you're building on? And there was dead silence. He didn't know what to do with it. I was kind and didn't follow up on it. But it was such a total different idea that we just have the right to build on it. The land is just there for us to do anything we want with. Um, of course, we have to use some of the land for our own needs. But do we ask it? Do we connect to it? And what happens when we do that? That's what's important in terms of meeting needs. There's this wonderful book called um, We Are the Middle of Forever, written by Stan Rushworth, who is a Native American elder, and Dar Jamal, who's a um, world-class journalist. And they interviewed 12, 20 Native Americans about why, how we, how do we heal the relationship with the earth? And one of the beautiful things I said was, well, we could heal everything if the young people would learn how to sing the sun up every morning. Now, obviously, this we don't sing the sun up. We know that from science. But that misses the main point, because as you're singing the sun up, you are in relationship with. It's not just something automatic off in the distance. I lived in a Sherpa village once, way on the border of Tibet, and they had a feeling of um, that you didn't want to defecate in the water, because if you did, you made the gods angry. Well, we may not necessarily believe in making the gods angry, but there's a wisdom there, a wisdom there that's not verbal, that's not abstract, it's an understanding of connections. Another question in that book with um, We're the Middle of Forever was, how do I visit my water? The whole idea is, if we're in relationship with, we're going to act incredibly differently. And we have cut those relations, not we have, we've, we've been born into a world that cuts those connections. Um, if we're disconnected from our roots, from our relatives, um, we're disconnected from other expressions of life, be it a, a tree or whatever it is. Um, we're disconnected from the wisdoms and intelligences and the spirits that enrich us immensely. Um, and again, we activate different parts of our brain. I run a wildlife sanctuary and often people will come and, and they'll just spend some time, say, visiting with the wolves. And they'll talk to each other. And I swear I'm gonna have a duct tape retreat because it's, and, and they all really mean well, and they're only gonna have an hour or so with the wolves, but we're so oriented towards questions and intellectual stuff that they're talking and they're asking questions. And when you ask questions, you move to a different part of the brain where you can't connect to the animals. You have to connect to them from a nonverbal place and then magic happens. And uh, that happens when we connect with any part of nature, we're going to a different part of our brain, activating different capacities. Uh, that are rich and full of creative potential for how we can think differently and live differently. Um, again, I think one of the most important things that happens when we connect deeply with nature is a sense of coherence. Coherence with something larger, coherence within ourselves, the way our society is set up, we go to a doctor for a heart and a doctor for a stomach as if they're not connected. Um, everything we do, facilitates the disconnect, sense of disintegration, disconnection, integration, and coherence is a very fundamental human need. From there, we can operate uh, effectively, more like a laser, but with richness as well as the focus of it. Um, it being with nature helps us shift our orientation to a wider understanding. We're so oriented to human needs, partly it's purely biological and completely understandable, partly it's our upbringing, but if we're totally focused on human needs, we do this for humans. And even people who talk to me say, okay, humans and animals. No, wait a minute. What about plants in the land? Um, we keep uh, limiting our understanding of the whole um, and focusing on human needs will not get us where we want. Focusing on human needs in the context of everybody else's needs will get us where we want. Another thing that nature does is help us slow down. And from there come all kinds of wisdoms and awarenesses. And we're so left brain, we're such a left brain culture and so rushed. We need to use, integrate somehow that slow down creative process as we're doing the abstract, brilliant, fast thinking so that it's all one whole because otherwise we leave 
we get disconnected again and we're up into exciting plans that aren't going to really actually solve anything because we're not in tune with how nature works. And to walk at the pace of life. One of the interviews he's in that um, book talked about, we need to slow down deliberately. A lot of native people deliberately work, walk slowly to be at earth's pace so that we're connecting with the earth rather than rushing across it off in our own heads. Um, Susan, speaking of pace, we're gonna oh, need to move, move on to have some time for questions for you. Thank you, I'm finished. All right, great. So any, uh, I'm gonna share again, um, any questions or comments uh, uh, for Susan? And you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and let us know. And again, I can't see the screen, so. Oh, Iva. Hi, um, Susan, do you think you could speak a little bit more about the what you see as the interrelationship between human rights and earth rights, like how we've evolved so that now we need to bring those two things together as a framework for an interdependent life with each other and with the planet. Yeah, hi, Iva. So we've actually been on a kind of a trajectory historically um, with the idea of human rights and then women's rights and then uh, the rights of people who aren't white and then animal rights. And we're just on the verge because there are new movements now about nature having rights. Um, so we're actually moving ahead, even though it seems we're not, um, our, our awareness is. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about the word of rights as um, respect for their existence and acting with respect for their existence. And that if you want to go in that direction, the idea of the sacredness of all life and that everything needs to be respected. And therefore we, we make policies and we live our lives based on that understanding. Any other comments or questions? Then let's just because of time, let's move on to Janice. Thank you, Terry. And thank you, uh, Terry and Susan, for inviting me um, to speak with you today about this topic that means a lot to me um, from my personal journey that I will share briefly with you uh, today. So I wanted to start with just a quick um, background and share that my career in banking uh, spans back 15 years, it was not my first job, it was not something that I had wanted to be when I was a kid or thought about being. It was something that I got into based on, um, I think the basic needs that we touched on earlier, stability, um, probably being the most um, important need that was being met when I got into banking. It was definitely not because I thought I would be, it would be a fulfilling career to pursue. <laughs> Um, I had grown up loving earth sciences like astronomy, marine biology, ecology, archaeology, uh, et cetera. And um, that's what I thought I would be when I grew up. <laughs> um, I had also been in banking before the 08 crisis. And so after that, it did make me feel like I'd made the wrong choice um, to work in such a volatile industry. But after taking time off, I worked at a scuba diving shop for a while. That that need popped up again about craving stability, um, benefits, um, things, you know, needs that were not being met in that other job. So I got back into banking and um, before discovering New Resource Bank, uh, even though I knew that what my passions were and my interests, I wasn't clear about what my purpose was and actually hadn't really thought about it very much. And I didn't know that I needed it in my life. I didn't know that that was a fundamental need that was not being met. And so in 2014, I had the 
privilege of traveling to the Ecuadorian Amazon with a new resource bank client on a delegation trip. And that experience turned out to be a journey of self-discovery, uh, which I am still so eternally grateful for. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone here was on the call when um, we had an ESPN event in July on transformational nature stories. But um, during that event, I did share more details about that experience and how it transformed me. But every moment of that experience um, helped me reorient my sense of self and help me understand what I truly needed to live a fulfilling life on this planet and how desperately it needed our protection. I saw the devastation from the oil spills there and how people were getting sick and dying and people that had lived there for centuries. And it was just so disturbing on so many levels. <clears throat> um, so it was this experience and the company moments of introspection that really showed me that every action that I took from that point on had to tie into the fundamental need of having purpose, finding my why, um, making a difference, not just consuming, paying my rent to the earth in exchange mm -hmm. for the gift of life. And, <clears throat> uh, and ultimately protecting the planet. And so it also meant that I, that I needed fulfillment in my career and to be of service to those that serve people and the planet. And being able to see that impact by supporting our amazing clients was, was part of that. And so in 2018, Amalgamated Bank acquired New Resource Bank, and we are now the largest B Corp certified bank in the country. We're also the oldest socially responsible bank. Uh, next year is our centennial. And uh, my current role, coupled with my role as co-chair of our green team, um, has confirmed that my fundamental need is being met. Um, <clears throat> Over the years, I have seen incredible examples of their leadership in the banking industry. And um, it just to, to share what our mission is, is to empower individuals and organizations to achieve positive social change. So as a bank, I, that's unheard of. I've never seen that before. Um, and even when I joined your resource bank, their motto was Planet Smart Banking. So that was kind of the tip of the, the iceberg for me of getting into you know, values-based banking. And I see examples of how we're, um, as a bank, achieving positive social change, too, every day. And so I just wanted to share a few, a few quick highlights <clears throat> that include being the first bank to endorse and one of three banks, U.S. banks, to sign the U.N. Principles of Responsible Banking, uh, being a founding member of the Net Zero Banking Alliance, and the first U.S. bank to have our science-based net zero targets approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative, which include a 49% reduction in emissions by 2030 and net zero greenhouse emissions in our financing operations by 2045. We're also the first uh, bank to endorse HR 40, which was a piece of legislation that created a commission to develop reparation proposals for African-Americans. And most recently, after three declined uh, applications, we received approval from the International Standards Organization for a new merchant category code uh, to be created for gun and ammunition stores. Previously, uh, merchant category code had not existed and will now allow for all banks and credit card companies to better track suspicious activity, which is generally how they do that by assigning category codes to all kinds of merchants, gas stations, retail, restaurants, uh, salons, and so forth. So I believe that I have a pretty unique career in banking <clears throat> and also believe that I couldn't be more fulfilled because I work for a bank that actively supports positive social change and I'm seeing, I'm seeing that. Um, there are times when I think back to that experience in the Amazon, and I hold that very dear in my heart as a beacon to guide me when life gets really challenging. And I will never take for granted, um, you know, the plethora of conveniences that we have in this country, and also reminding myself of what we truly need to feel fulfilled, um, to feel safe, to feel nourished, to feel loved and joyful. I saw, you know, to Terry's point earlier, I believe it's like they had a bench, a little, excuse me for one second. <laughs> I 
They had a bench, a little stove and a kitchen area, a small retro TV and a hammock in their, in their two-story house. Um, and that was it. And I've never seen people be so joyful in life and just really, you know, on the other side of it, so hurt and um, in despair about what was happening to their environment and, and their resources that they relied on and have for centuries. And so uh, <clears throat> before going to the Amazon, I had come to the realization that what was missing for me was looking at every thought and action through the lens of protecting nature <clears throat> and ensuring that the company I work for does the same. And so at this point in my life, I truly feel as though this fundamental need is being met. And I uh, wanted to say thank you for, for listening. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, let's uh, uh, return to uh, any questions that you might have uh, for her. Um, so, and you can put them in the chat comments uh, or go live. You want to raise your hand. If, if not, I'm not seeing any, anybody else seeing any questions or comments in the chat? I can't. Uh, I see one question yeah. about how our industry peers have responded. Yeah. And, um, that's a great question. And I think that a lot of banks are starting to follow suit. It does usually take one organization to, to start leading the way and creating change. And, you know, as an example, um, other U.S. banks have signed on to the U.N. Principles of Responsible Banking. Other U.S. banks have um, <clears throat> joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Um, others have, you know, created net zero targets, although some are still um, financing fossil fuels, which we don't do. Um, and uh, we also don't finance weapons manufacturers or private prisons. And so I think there is some, um, whether you want to call it, I don't know, cognitive dissonance or what, but there's a disconnect there between their verbal commitments and, and uh, what their actions are doing. So um, I think everyone is starting to kind of play along and especially from public pressure. Um, you'll see, you know, Rainforest Action is a huge um, activist in getting banks to stop funding uh, the climate crisis. And some of the, you know, they released a report called Banking on Climate Chaos, which does highlight which banks are funding them still. So you can see the data on which banks have funded, um, you know, tar sands, oils, or fossil fuels, and then when they've done it versus when they made these net zero commitments. So it's all, you know, I think everyone's on their different journey. And as long as everyone, we do want everyone to, um, to follow and, and be part of this movement with us, um, I would encourage you to check out uh, Global Alliance for Banking on Values if you want to see examples of other banks like us in the world. Um, that are have a social impact model to to their business as a bank. Beautiful, Janice. Um, you are truly an inspiration. They uh, are so fortunate to have you as a spokesperson. Uh, Prasad mm -hmm. has a question, and then I think we should try to get close to wrapping up. Yeah, actually, I have a comment. Uh, I'm feeling like I'm so blessed with people, with uh, you know, with this. Uh, um, topic and also listening to experts who have been in the more or less, more or less same uh, journey with me, changing their courses in their life, uh, including lifestyles. When Janice told me that um, uh, she she was particular on what how he ch how she changed her um, journey, uh, it reminded me of my journey. I'm an organic chemist um, um, by training, and I started working in pharma industry. At one point of time, um, I have um, access to 20 pharmaceutical technologies to save people's lives. And what I realized after moving to US is there are a lot of pollution around that technologies also. So I have to make a call whether I should pursue my career in that direction at all. I'm talking like technology, talking about technologies like uh, a Lipitar, which, can, which has 9 billion um, footprint in the market, you know, it's a lot of money and I have to make a call whether I should pursue my career in that direction or not. I don't know what to do, but I, I, my guts told me, Prasad, if you want to pursue your um, career in writing, stop doing what others are doing, stop following and 
be an honest chemist start telling people what these chemicals and medicines are doing because not many people uh, in the world don't know the other side of the story of medicine making or even our own medicine i am telling all these things as a medicinal com medicinal chemist so that's my story i am so blessed to be here today thank you thank you <clears throat> thank you so much for sharing that prasad yeah it's really wonderful prasad really appreciate that um so i just one, I, I don't think I'll spend more than a few seconds on this, but just um, I just really want to acknowledge IKEA for its leadership on sustainability overall, and specifically for its work on fundamental needs, where they uh, people are called co-workers, they're not called employees, which I think is really cool. Commitment to diversity, innovation, learning, improving, open communications, annual anonymous company-wide survey that they do. Half their uh, U.S. co-workers do flex hours, compress schedules, telecommute, job share. So it's really been a remarkable example on, on many different levels. I hope at some point we'll be able to actually do a session with IKEA uh, because they really are doing such important work. It's a really great model and uh, won't have time for questions about the IKEA. Um, and Tulasi, you know, I'm just wondering, um, I know we're just at our time. We're over our time, 101. Um, uh, do we have time to have just any open discussion or do we need to close out? No, we can continue if people would like to. Sure. All right. All right. Because we didn't really have anything else, um, you know, in terms of conclusion, but these are just some of the questions that we had come up with um, that would just love your, uh, you could put it in the chat, any of your answers, or we can just open it up to discussion. If you just raise your hand so that we can see you. Like, how has this affected you? Like hearing this, I, I know Anna Reese said she's going to go out and uh, take care of her native plants. Um, but how, you know, what what kinds of things came to you as you heard, uh, you know, from Janice and Susan and myself or Max Neef actually um, about different possibilities, and 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 also back to Anna Reese's question earlier on about. Um, so, what do we do with this? How can we move these kinds of ideas forward? Uh, to make them happen. So open it up to any comments, questions, suggestions that you might have. May I go first? Sure. Yeah, first thing comes to my mind is uh, stop growing lawns in our front yard and backyard. Grow some mm -hmm. orchids, whatever it is, and even vegetables so that we can connect to the community, share those things with our neighbors and you know do good things without using fertilizers and pesticides to begin with. Uh, that's my humble thought at this moment. That's great, Prasad. So get rid of those lawns and grow good food that we can help feed people with and without the pesticides and fertilizers. Love that. What other ideas? And again, I can't see the chat. So if somebody sees something uh, in there, please share. Anari. I'm just wondering if we maybe could have a checklist, you know, a little bit in line with Anne's thought about, um, you know, restating a, a new statement for business ethics, but maybe a checklist that you could work through with companies you're thinking of investing in or, you mm -hmm. know, companies you're consulting with or involved with or some, because I, you know, we do have a business focus in this network. So yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to think how, how could we make it, you know, practical and get people to start thinking through where they're at and how they could change. Well, you know, one of the things that just came to me as you said that just now was, you know, there are lists like 100 best companies to work for and or 100 best workplaces for mothers or women or, you know, people of color. So, you know, maybe it's something that we should think about at ASBN, doing our own awards or acknowledgements of companies that are really doing cutting edge work in some of these areas to highlight and educate, you know, other companies about them and to pat them on the back for doing great work. And there are just so many of them. Um, I think it would be wonderful to do some acknowledgement. What other ideas and thoughts? Any key takeaways for you? One thing I would think, always think about is you know, incentivizing good players. 
reward them so that many would follow the suit otherwise you know the game is same you know it's all about uh, um, what we call uh, the profit accounting um, it is time to um, get on to impact accounting um, so that we would lead a respectable life and leave this planet to our next generation thank you Beautiful. You know, one thing I didn't, as you, as you were saying that, it made me think about one thing I didn't talk about, which I normally do in these presentations when I have more time, is um, just about voluntary simplicity, um, which is really a growing movement, uh, 10 to 20 percent. And, and in some cases, I won't say it was voluntary. For many young people today, it's really required that they live a much more simple life and focus on experiences rather than more possessions. Um, and so I think maybe more acknowledgement of that. And I have friends, for example, who love to do thrift shopping, um, you know, and so do we need to be keep buying fast fashion clothes that are then being piled up and, you know, discarded that take all kinds of toxic dyes and chemicals to manufacture and harm the workers at the same time? Or could we reuse clothes and make that more widely accepted um, that that's cool to do that kind of thing, living a simpler life. This is a great point, um, uh, Terry. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm going through that journey. Um, uh, believe me or not, I haven't printed a page, brochure, or a t-shirt, or a cap. Ours is all volunteer-run organization. We are living, um, actually sustaining on small donations from friends and family. Uh, I know it's tough call, but again, it's a sweet pain to go through so that we would be at least you know, making some strides, uh, walking the path. Uh, thank you for inspiring us today. Yeah. Other thoughts? I mean, one thing that just came as you were saying that, Prasad, is this whole movement that's growing called effective altruism. And our Alliance for Sustainability newsletter has a feature about it this week. Um, it's an amazing movement where you actually have the opportunity to look at how you as an individual can actually be far more than you imagined in terms of your impact um, through your volunteer donating 10% of your income, you know, tithing essentially. And there are more than 7,000 people who've committed to doing that. Um, and then they can look at the impact by supporting nonprofits and volunteering in their communities and living with less, I, it's, it's really quite profound, the impact. And, and the people who do it are happy uh, and feel fulfilled and having all kinds of fundamental needs being met. Any other last thoughts? Because I think if not, any, any other comments that you guys see in the chat? Well, I, I love the idea of somehow another translating this into culture change within ASBN. Uh-huh. Would love that. And that's our media and culture change group. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what we're yes. supposed to be doing. Exactly. So we're trying. Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, thanks. So maybe we can end with this uh, beautiful quote from Pat and Jolly, which I hope applies for all of you. When you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds, your mind transcends limitations, your consciousness expands in every direction, and you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. And I think that's really the possibility for what we all together can create. And so I just want, my last thoughts are, thank you for taking time from your day and being open to having this discussion. I hope it really supports you. Um, Janice or uh, Susan, do you any last comments from you? No, wonderful, Terry. Not for me either, but just gratitude for everyone. Just time. Yeah. Thank, thank you all. So this is this is our future, and we would welcome any last comments. How valuable this was for you? You know, would you be interested in learning more? Should we do a session on this at the ASBN conference? Are there organizations, you know, can see if we can borrow Susan and Janice to, <laughs> to, to do this again uh, for other groups. We'd be very open to that. So um, that'd be great. I think so, I'd really like to follow up on Anari's suggestion of, okay, so how do we in, 
How do we make this happen? And that'll mm-hmm. probably be another few conversations at least. Sure. I'd love that, Susan. That'd be great. So I just want to say thank you again to everybody. Um, to us, you want to, any last comments? Upcoming events or anything else you want to share? No, I just want to thank everyone for coming and let you all know the Livable Planet Working Group is doing an amazing transformational experiences in nature session at the ASVM conference in San Diego, November 30th to December 2nd. If you can come, it'll be a very special experience compared to doing it virtually to be able to convene and do this in person. So I dropped that link in the chat. Thanks for doing that. But yes, thank you all for joining. Thank you, Terry, Susan, Janice, for putting this amazing presentation together. I learned a lot. Great. All Thank right. you all. Nice meeting you. Thanks for joining, everybody. And I will putting, be putting this recording on our website later today. Thank you for doing that. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. And maybe, Susan, I don't know if you can stay on sure. um, or Janice, if, if you can, we'd just love to check in with you for a minute. To ask you, if you if you have time, great. I'll stop recording.